Okay, I guess we can start. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to Bridge Internal Audit. So the context for this call is that we've been working on bridges, first the POA bridge, now uh, substrate to substrate bridge for um, the last seven months, I think. And we are close to uh, releasing or, or close to having the code be production ready. And uh, we, we plan to deploy this to Polkadot and Kusama to bridge these two chains. And uh, we are um, working with an external auditor company as well. And that audit will happen around January. But before this, or rather, we would have you identify uh, some security issues or some problems or usability problems with the bridge before that so that we can be prepared and make the external audit go much quicker and hopefully get get it deployed faster. And also like the second diary purpose of this call is to make everyone here aware of the of the progress and what uh, and the design of the bridge and how it, it could be useful for you. Um, once again, uh, we are recording this and there is a plan to make it public uh, as well. But if you are not comfortable with that, we can edit out whatever uh, you want from this recording. So it's not, we are not live. It's, it's rather, it's just being recorded. Just making sure, yeah. Um, cool, so I, I think it that uh, there is a document that should be part. Oh yeah, Hernando already posted it here. I'm gonna send it again, unless um, in, in case someone joined after it was posted. And we will be, throughout the call, we will be actually going through this document and explaining you um, the bridge concepts. And the idea is that we will start with a high level overview of the bridge. So just mentioned like how it's structured and architectured. Then Hernando will show a demo how uh, it looks like on a test network, or rather two test networks uh, bridged with, uh, with a test deployment of the bridge. And then the plan is to go through this test scenario that Hernando is going to present um, and go into, into details of that particular scenario. Uh, so we will go through like all these layers and, and kind of, you know, dive deep into what happens in every step of the scenario and what is the bridge doing and what is the runtime state and so on. And I expect you guys to kind of follow along and ask questions in the meantime, at any point in time. And on your demand, we can either kind of divert from this agenda or we can uh, kind of go deeper if needed. We can show you the exact code. Um, and I expect that, that a lot of questions will be clarifications, but I would also like you to think about what can go wrong. So what if I, like, what if I try to attack this bridge? What if I try to send many of this kind of transactions? Or, if, or what if I send a malformed payload? So feel free to ask this kind of questions. And we hope to provide answers during this call. If not, then we will definitely lock this down and make it fixed before before the release. Um, any questions so far? Cool. Um, yeah, um, feel free to interrupt me. I'm not sure if I'm gonna... Like, uh, is there a sound if someone raises hands in Google Meet? Can someone try that? Okay, did someone raise their hand? Okay. I guess there is a sound there. <laughs> so uh, I will try to pay attention, but if not, just like unmute yourself and, and, and start screaming. Um, okay, yeah, I'm gonna jump to this high level uh, overview document first. I have it open here. Oh, and let me maybe share my screen so that you guys can also see my cursor because I imagine I'm gonna be moving it around things that I speak about. 
All right, so let's go to the high level overview. Um, so yeah, first things first. So the, the purpose of the bridge is to connect two substrate based chains uh, and to let them interact or rather to let the users of each chain interact with each other. And by substrate based chains, we actually mean a specific subset of substrate based chains because we, we focus on chains that use grandpa finality gadget. So we don't care about how blocks are produced on these chains. The only thing that matters is there is grandpa running and uh, it finalizes uh, some of these blocks. Um, and when we talk about the bridge, we mean a two-way bridge. So it means that chain A and chain B can both speak to each other, uh, but in the context of kind of analysis, we are focusing on one way bridging because uh, having a two way bridge is actually deploying two one way bridges. Uh, so most of the stuff that we talk about here is going to be kind of one sided. And also to name the chains, we use source chain and the target chain. So the source chain is where the interaction begins and the target chain is where the interaction happens. So uh, a user will always be, or most likely will be a user of the source chain and something will be happening on the target chain. So the transaction is sent on the source chain, source chain but uh, the effect is seen on the target chain. Um, yeah, and the bridge has um, like three layers, three main layers. When we think about bridge, we think about three main layers. And the first one is called header sync. So the first thing that we, since we are building a trustless bridge here, the first thing that we want to achieve is for the target chain to be able to uh, verify things that happened on the source chain. And we do that by implementing a light client of the source chain within target chain's uh, runtime. Uh, since we talk about substrate-based chains, this is, this is just a frame palette that is deployed on the target chain and it's able to, um, you can submit headers from the source chain to this palette and it's verifying them and storing in the storage. And you can also submit finality proof for some of the headers and we are able to verify them and follow the uh, grandpa consensus along. So uh, authority set handoffs. Um, when we have this, this uh, source of truth maintained, so we know headers of the, of the source chain, we can build on top of that. So we have something that is called message delivery um, and that's like the second layer that we build on top of this header sync. And it's, uh, it's, it's also a frame palette that is responsible for uh, queuing up and then maintaining an ordered delivery of messages from the source chain to the target chain. So the message delivery itself doesn't care uh, that much about the payload of the message. So it's, we, we separate this um, responsibility to another layer, uh, which is just message dispatch. The delivery palette will only care about uh, delivering these messages in order. So taking them from the source chain and then uh, having target chain know about them. And it's, it's actually like coupled with the dispatch because in our design, whenever a message is delivered to the target chain, it's immediately dispatched on that chain as well. We have considered, um, uh, oh, did someone raise hands? Oh, did I miss you? Hernando, yeah, go ahead, Hernando. No, I, I dropped the link to the, the document you're reading from. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> but do you have your hand uh, raised? Uh, I'm going to lower it now, okay. Um, where were I? Yeah, here. Um, so 
whenever we deliver the message, it's it's being dispatched. We have considered um, scenarios where this is not necessarily the true. Uh, this is not necessarily true. True. So we first deliver messages, and then dispatch happens kind of asynchronously from the delivery. Um, but for now, we have decided to go with the simple approach where the delivery and dispatch is, is sort of happens at the same time. So within the same um, target chain transaction. And I will go into details in, in more into details of this palettes later later on. So here I'm just like trying to outline the, the high level concepts that I, I speak of. Um, yeah, is there anything else in delivery? Delivery is basically users can submit messages on the source chain and uh, there is some mechanism that actually transports these messages to the target chain. And then the target chain can interpret these messages, interpret the payload, and that's actually message dispatch uh, responsibility. So if they are delivered and we know that they are not replayed, they are delivered in order, then we try to interpret the payload and we try to understand what's, what's the purpose of the message and what, what side effect should it cause on the, on the target chain. And obviously, like these three layers have, um, have this additional uh, actors that are sort of outside of the runtime that are involved in, in bridging and we call them relayers. So there is a, a relayer for headers or, or a set of relayers for headers and relayers for messages. As I said, this message dispatch is sort of coupled with delivery, so we don't have separate relayers for, for delivery and dispatch here. <clears throat> yeah, and what happens, like let's dive a little bit deeper. So, um, the header sync, so yeah, every bridge that we have been building so far has been using the same kind of high level layout. Uh, initially, we have started off with uh, Ethereum proof of authority bridge to substrate, um, substrate based chain. So you can imagine that the header sync was uh, a little bit different depending on the side you look at. Uh, but here, uh, since, since both of the chains are assumed to be uh, substrate-based chains. They 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 will have exactly the same uh, palettes deployed. So for some cases, even though I'm describing like one-way sync, it's actually going to look exactly the same uh, when we speak about the second uh, direction. Um, and the message delivery, when I just go to this uh, later on, actually requires both of these sides to be. To be present, so it's it's actually tied to a bidirectional bridge. So regarding the header sync palette, uh, there is a palette called Substrate Bridge, and it's an on-chain light client for um, substrate-based chains that use grandpa finality. As I said earlier, we don't really care about the block production mechanism, so it can be either Aura, it can be Babe, it could be even proof of work, because we honestly don't verify this at all. We only Just care. Verify. Yes, sorry, go ahead. I have an issue with that. So, with Aura and with Babe, and indeed with proof of work, we can limit the number of headers that exist. Uh, like, you know, the difficulty or the, the aura, it's just a round robin. We can limit the number of headers that exist. If we can't limit the number of headers that exist, how are we going to stop spam, spamming your fake headers, basically? Yes, that's a very good concern, and we have it listed um, already. Um, I don't think we have a solution yet. Uh, one solution would be, and this is something that we are, we are considering, is because uh, the way the palette works is that we actually accept headers before we have finality proofs for them. So as Alistair said, since we don't verify the headers, we don't verify who authored them, you can actually spam the chain with, with multiple headers that seemingly look valid because they decode and they, they 
have some values inside. They build on a correct chain, for instance. So all the things that we do verify um, are satisfied, but uh, we store them on chain and only when the when finality proof arrives, we submit this finality proof on chain and then do something about it. Um, so yeah, this is something we don't have a solution yet and it's listed as a, as a known issues. Obviously we could just limit number of potential forks that we see on chain, but this is definitely suboptimal because you can just spam the network with <laughs> to, to like, you know, um, to um, saturate this limit and then what, what should happen then. Um, yeah, that's, that's something we don't really know yet. And, and one solution would be, yeah, we should just wait for finality first and we only import headers that have finality proofs. That's already tricky with Grandpa. How so? Uh, it wouldn't be an issue with Beefy, but with Grandpa we have an issue that we can have boats for multiple uh, block hashes that count uh, for the common answers to get finalized. Which means you need conceptually to have more headers than a final. Okay, I see what you mean. Because the finality proof might be for a block, for instance, no, so, so, n so plus we two. Might right? finality, we might have a finality proof for block n that includes headers from block n plus one that we don't even know are going to be, ever be final. Mm -hmm. Include block hashes of headers from, 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 for block n plus one, which, which help us finalize block n. And they might not ever be finalized. This is, this is a big downside with Grandpa. Uh, means you really need this option when you're using Grandpa. Hernando Slava, do you guys want to comment on this? Uh, no, I've got nothing yet. I'm, I'm happy to hear what, whatever Alistair has to say. I mean, so, so there is a solution which is use Beefy when it's ready. Which, but it won't be for this for this bridge deployment. So we'll have to go with the existing solution. So the only other solution is, is actually try and verify Babe or Aura for the headers, but that's bad because you need an abstraction and we need to implement it. <laughs> it's a lot more work. Just for some context, Tomic, do you want to give like a little quick spiel on what Beefy is? Um, yeah, so Beefy is this um, kind of alternative gadget uh, or it, it can be considered a gadget to Grandpa because it, it piggybacks uh, a lot on, on some of the assumptions that Grandpa has. But it's a, a, an extra finality gadget that uh, Alistair developed to, uh, to, to create, uh, to, to make Ethereum bridge possible. So Beefy itself, it, uh, it's, it's sort of like an abstraction of the crypto that Grandpa is using. So for instance, Grandpa is, is already tied to ED um, keys, as far as I remember. And with Beefy, we can, we can ask Grandpa validators to do another round of signature collection for finality, uh, but we can use different crypto. So for instance, for, for Ethereum, we use uh, SecP, which is easily verifiable on, uh, on the Ethereum side. And also Beefy can be coupled with uh, something that is called Merkle Mountain Range that allows us to, because like the regular light clients, if you build them, they require you to create a full chain of all the headers in the, uh, that are in, the, in that particular chain. So you need to be able to verify ancestry. So when you have finality information, you actually need all the headers as well throughout the entire chain. And this is a lot of data. So with Beefy coupled with Merkle Mountain Range, we can collect these signatures from Grandpa authorities, but on something that is not necessarily a header. And we collect them on a Merkle Mountain Range root hash, which is this kind of aggregated data structure that uh, this, this root hash itself allows us to prove any, any past header um, like since Genesis. So just having one, um, one this, this beefy, signed beefy commitment, we call them, uh, signed by the grandpa authority set, we are able to uh, figure out or, or we are able to verify a proof that there was a particular header some point in the time. Um, we still need to 
track the authority set changes. So we, we, we can't just have, like we can't immediately sync from Genesis to, to the latest block because we need to be able to make sure that every authority set transition was done correctly. Um, but it, it significantly lowers the amount of data that we actually need to import to create a light client because it's, it's only necessary to import one commitment per, uh, per session currently because authority set, um, authority set doesn't change every session, but the keys that they use change every session. So in summary, we have more technology coming uh, and uh, quite a lot more in terms of new designs, even beyond what, what we're trying to do for, with BP right now. But at the moment, if we're, we're trying to audit this and deploy this tomorrow, uh, we, you're working with grandpa, right? And headers, and this is going to have some downsides. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, um, we have that noted down. We can discuss potential solutions later on, or I really invite you to join Bridges channel, which is not super active because we also have an internal bridge, bridge construction worker channel that we use more often, but uh, maybe we will, like, I really hope that we will uh, have some more um, feedback from, from other people as well, and we will be open for that feedback. Um, yeah, I know that this is a pretty big <laughs> downside, um, and this is especially troublesome uh, because uh, with our design, the relayers that are responsible to sync the headers, they don't need to be registered on chain in any form. So it also means they don't uh, don't need any stake on chain. So we there is no really a good way to disincentivize this other than just pure transaction cost of submitting these these headers and yeah that's that might be a potential solution that we make this um, the cost of submitting headers extremely high so you have to put up a lot of deposit to actually submit this header but if it turns out to be a finalized header later on then we will reimburse you or something like this Mm. Yeah, so the pilot is uh, responsible for first tracking all the headers that, that it sees that, that are delivered to this pilot through, by the relayers. And it's also, it can also, uh, like it, al it also gets finality proofs, which it verifies and then um, marks a particular chain as the, as the canonical finalized chain. Um, since it verifies finality proofs, it actually has to follow grandpa authority set. Um, so we do know the latest authority set and we also need to keep track of, of the next authority set whenever it changes and make sure that, um, that we transition to the right set. So to prevent a DOS attack, like one of the form, one, one, one form of a DOS attack here is that we don't really let the chain grow arbitrarily long with grandpa. Because what we do is whenever we see there is a, a pending authority set change, which is signaled by a, by a digest item in a header, we actually require a finality proof before, before we progress on that chain. So you can imagine that we have, at some level, we might have multiple different forks, but these forks are, are limited into how much they can grow because they can only grow to the, to the pending authority set change and then they, they won't be able to grow further. So what Alistair was mentioned, what we don't have covered yet is how to limit number of, of potential forks at, at like any, any particular kind of block number. So yeah, even limiting to the authority set change has problems. No, I, I think it should be fine. So the way Grandpa works is that we can't vote the current authority set don't beyond, can't vote beyond the change. So when it comes to the authority set change, well, at least then all votes will be for that block. All Grandpa votes will be for that block. 
so it doesn't have the downside that earlier blocks can have, uh, earlier finalizations can have when we might have we might need things that, that never actually get finalized, headers that never actually get finalized to understand the block hashes of grandpa folks that are required to finalize stuff. This doesn't happen for the authority set change. Mm -hmm. um, which means that you might be able to be optimistic about uh, what headers you need to include. So it may be that, so most grandpa proofs of finality are not going to include any, uh, are probably going to be, you know, at least sometimes you'd expect to have grandpa, the grandpa validators at the moment, that they're, they're voting very fast compared to block production. So you'd expect at least sometimes that they all vote on the same block and you don't have to then worry about needing headers that you don't want to put on chain. So one option would be to, uh, to wait for finality proofs of that form but then sometimes if grandpa is having trouble, if we, we're catching up, like sometimes happen, as, as happened in the past, then basically you, you might be stuck on, the, the entire relay might be stuck until the authority set change. And when the authority set change happens, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to have a vote that, that makes that makes sense with only finalized headers. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Hernando, would you mind writing it down so I don't switch uh, context so often? Yeah, sure. So well, I, I was actually not like that. I was going to ask some something about this as well. Are we using the headers from the justification itself, or do we always need to have the headers imported already? <clears throat> because the um, if we are using like the grandpa justification type, it should include like the commit and all of the headers that are necessary to um, interpret that commit. So for example, if we are voting, if we are finalizing block A and someone voted for block C, then this proof should include the headers A, B, and C. So if we are going just by the proof, like it, it's self-contained, it, it includes all of the data that's necessary to, to validate it. And yeah, we don't even need to import these uh, these headers into into the, the chain. So yeah. In theory, if we have that, then what you could do is we could put the justification on first, and then go backwards for for, for, for the headers that you know the, the skip blocks from the justification. And yeah. that way, you'd be able to only send headers that are actually required. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I guess I guess we can we can discuss these uh, implementation details later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's let's go back to this at um, like later stage. I guess maybe when we dive into code or or like after we go through the, the higher level stuff. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. I have a small sequence diagram here that shows how the source chain, the relayer, and the target chain interacts. So uh, with the with the header sync process, basically. Um, so on the source chain, the blocks are constantly produced. Then the relay relayer is actually listening for for new blocks. And every time a block is created, it creates a transaction that contains that block and that delivers that block to the target chain. Uh, currently, the API of the pallet allows you to submit one block at a time. Uh, but since we have utils batch we can actually batch multiple calls to that pallet and submit multiple blocks with one transaction. This is, however, something that we have listed in the known issues uh, section in the document as well, because currently we use one transaction per block always. So initially on the target chain, the pallet knows only about the Genesis block. When the first block is created and the relayer tries to submit it to the target chain, then the pallet updates, like it imports the, the block, does a bunch of verifications. So for instance, it checks that it builds on the, on the, on the previous block that we have, that we know of, that um, you know, the structure is correct and so on. So when it passes this basic verification, it's imported on chain and stored on chain. So the pallet now knows that the best block is one. Same with block two. Now, in case of forks, because 
we now see that on the source chain block to prim was in, uh, imported. Um, the relayer will submit block to prim as well, and the pilot is able to track multiple forks, uh, multiple forks uh, on the source chain as well. Um, obviously, up until finality. So when we have finality for to prim, we submit finality. Let the relayer submits the finality proof, and then the pilot actually updates both best known block and finalized block. Um, two more things regarding known issues here. Uh, so currently the pilot does not prune old blocks. This is something that we have to uh, still implement before an actual deployment. And this has consequences for applications that are built on top because Right now we store the entire history, so at any point in time in the future you are able to prove um, something that happened in block one, let's say. Um, but if we introduce proving, it means that there is like this fixed window where you actually have to submit your proofs. Otherwise, uh, the, the, uh, the palette will not know about this block anymore. Uh, there is a way to kind of overcome this with MMR, for instance, um, but yeah, this is this is like a separate uh, topic completely. And obviously, on the target chain, we can only do something. So we can only, um, you know, perform some interaction to dispatch some messages only when blocks are finalized, because only then we are guaranteed that they are not going to be reverted or rather if if they are reverted then, then someone is losing a lot of money yeah i also want to make a quick note like we manually like that genesis header we manually have to import it into the target chain so right now that's done through a pseudo call basically um otherwise the bridge doesn't know like where to start Yeah, and obviously if we want to deploy to Polkadot or Kusama, we won't be syncing all of the past headers, but we will start not at Genesis block, but at some, some block um, in time. Um, also for kind of security measures initially, the bridge supports an owner account. So it, we can either go through governance, because governance is, is basically always um, privilege to do to control uh, the palette um, or we can set this sort of like pseudo account but only for bridge related stuff and the, the admin let's call it <laughs> let's call it properly is able to halt uh, halt bridge operations so it can stop importing new headers which will obviously prevent anything else from happening and I think the second action the admin can do is actually to transfer the ownership. So at some point in time, when we see that the bridge is working correctly, we are able to um, yeah, just kind of dissolve the admin and, and transfer to a non-existent account. Uh, we have an open issue to be able to reinitialize the palette, but I think it's not being implemented right now. And that's in case of like a super terrible failure when the header, like the header sync went on a fork and it's not able to recover and follow the canonical chain because of some bug or because of, um, yeah, finality issue on the, on the source chain. So that's something that we consider as well. Um, that will require like this manual intervention of saying, okay, let's revert now and then let's follow this, this other chain. Cool. Any other questions to the header sync? Okay, let's go further. <clears throat> um, okay, so regarding the relayers, so there is a set of relayers that are uh, that are dealing with headers, and they use the process that I just described, and they are not required to be staked or registered on chain at, at all. Uh, and we consider the header sync to be kind of like an essential part of the bridge. 
and the incentivization should happen on the on higher levels uh, layers. Um, initially, the first deployment, we like we also expect that it's not going to be. Um, uh, it's it's most likely going to be operated by us. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so we we obviously can't prevent anyone else from running the relayer code, but we don't cater for a situation where there is multiple relayers and they ha somehow like load balance between each other. Because what will happen now is that both of these relayers will take the same block one and will create the same transaction, will try to submit the same transaction on the target chain, and one of these calls will succeed and the second one will fail. So running a second relayer will just create a bunch of like transaction overhead on the target chain and the relayer will simply be burning money for, for the fees. Um, there is an idea to use unsigned transactions for headers delivery. This is something that we had implemented for uh, POA bridge. And that's really cool because the, the, that duplication can actually happen on the transaction pool level. So if you see the same header imported in, um, in, a, in, a, in this unsigned transaction, the transaction has to look exactly the same. So it means that we see that the same header is imported twice and no one is actually paying fees for that as well, but it requires a lot of more uh, research and especially this um, kind of header spam uh, problem that we have, that Alistair has al outlined earlier. Mm. Okay, let's proceed to message passing. Um, so, whenever uh, we have this header sync maintained, we are able to deliver messages from one chain to from the source chain to the target chain, and the target chain can verify that these messages has actually been sent by the source chain. The way it works is uh, implemented in message lane delivery palette. And the idea is that we support multiple lanes. You can think about them as, as of channels and messages can be added. Users can add messages to any of these lanes and then a relayer is responsible for, for a single lane and it takes messages from that lane and delivers them to the target chain. So message lane palette is, uh, is deployed both on the source chain and on the target chain. And on the source chain, it acts as a, as a queue of messages. So whenever we insert something to this channel or to this lane, the order of delivery has to stay exactly the same. And then on the target chain, it acts as a, um, yeah, we, we call it actually an outbound lane and an inbound lane. So we deliver messages from the outbound lane of the source chain to the inbound lane of the, of the target chain. Um, yeah, let me show this on a, on a diagram maybe. Uh, the message lane palette stores all the messages on chain currently. So whenever you queue a message, it stays on, uh, in the on-chain state. Uh, this has a nice consequence for the relayer implementation as well, because um, a message, if, it, if a message is imported at block n, let's say, and then we we get finality for like n plus three, and the message is still not delivered, it's totally fine to just read the state of n, of block n plus three because we know that the, messages, that the message is still there, right? So we can always just use the latest state when we are the relayer and we see all the messages that are not yet delivered. Uh, there is an optimization possible and this is also one of the uh, issues that we plan to work on in the future where we limit the reliance on on-chain state because basically if a message is submitted at, at a particular block, we could just remove it from the on-chain storage right away. And then the relayer would need to kind of index all of those messages off-chain and then deliver them to the target chain. For simplicity, uh, current implementation stores everything on-chain so it's like fully, um, fully stateless, the relayer implementation. 
So we can queue a bunch of messages uh, and we show a single lane here. Because the thing is that within a single lane, messages have to be delivered in order, but multiple lanes can, can, uh, can progress in parallel. So they are not dependent on, on each other. Um, so we queue a bunch of messages and in the state we store that the, the, there is three messages queued for the target chain delivery. Um, we also, like whenever someone sends a message or rather queues a message, we uh, reserve a reward and a fee uh, for that particular message. And I, like maybe we will go into more details during the, like after the demo. And then the relayer prepares a, uh, a delivery a message delivery transaction on the target chain, and it can del deliver a bunch of messages, um, like as many as, as, as fits in, in a single transaction, basically. Um, and as I said earlier, delivering the messages also means dispatching the messages on the target chain. Um, the target chain later on uh, stores that these messages one and two, and actually each message is associated with a nonce. And when I say message one, message two, you can think of a message with nonce one, message with nonce two. Um, and obviously if the target chain already had messages with nonces one and two delivered, it will only accept message three next, right? So after this particular uh, delivery, we store the next nonce to deliver equals three. And we also know that these previous messages has been uh, delivered by relayer one. Uh, the delivery protocol supports confirmations as well. So on the source chain, we will get an information back when these messages has been delivered on the target chain, um, delivered and dispatched in, in that particular case. Um, and when this delivery is uh, received by the source chain, it can actually prune the state and it can make reward payout for the relayer. Um, the relayer has to present a storage proof from the target chain, but we, have, we can go into more details later on. There is one more interaction that happens and it's uh, after a successful uh, delivery confirmation transaction is dispatched on the, on the source chain, uh, the relayer confirms that again to the target chain. And this allows the target chain to prune state from, um, from these things over here. So who delivered um, like some particular messages. And actually this is, um, this is just for convenience as well. The target chain could, could simply remove that right away, but to make the relayer implementation simpler, currently we store this on chain. And this is not necessarily, like it, it's not necessarily a separate transaction because we are able to bundle these two things in a single transaction. So when we deliver a next set of messages, we actually update something that is called an outbound lane state uh, to the target chain. And it's part of the same storage proof. So there is like little overhead to actually um, deliver these confirmations to the target chain. Um, yeah, <clears throat> regarding the dispatch. Uh, so the payload of the messages that we deliver and what happens on the target chain is actually an encoded call of the target chain. So we expect the user to know how to create a call on the target chain. Uh, the user is expected to encode this call and then this, this bytes payload is part of, the, part of the message. Obviously the source chain is not able to even read this. So it only knows that there is a blob, a bytes, bytes blob that is going to be delivered to the target chain and the target chain actually is able to read the payload and then do the dispatch. And one thing more, more worth notice, noticing here is since delivery and dispatch is decoupled, when we deliver messages, we don't care if the dispatch was successful or not, right? We consider the message to be delivered even if the dispatch failed. Mm, yeah, and I think we can go into 
origin, like what origin is used to dispatch these calls on the target chain later on when we go into um, into the part like scenario description because I think I took too much of the time already. Any questions so far? Okay, so let me hand over to Hernando who will show the demo. Yes, cool. Um, so I guess the demo I'm going to be going through is, let me see which diagram it is. So if you go to the doc, it's the uh, token transfer walkthrough, if you want to like follow along visually at home. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, this diagram. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes, no? Yes. All right, cool. Um, so the idea behind this um, demo is that we'll be sending tokens from the Malau chain, which is a, a substrate-based chain we have. Um, and we'll be, so an account from Malau will transfer to an account on a totally different substrate-based network, um, which in our case is Rialto Eve. Um, just to give you like a quick like intro to what these colors mean, the blue is like the whole header sync pipeline, and the purple is like the message delivery and dispatch. So we have uh, we have like this nice Docker Compose setup that we use to deploy our bridge. Um, and basically what it is is we have like Compose files for each one of the network. So here's like the Malau file. Um, and then we have a Compose file with all the different relayers. So I've got the header relayer here, another header relayer here. Um, and then later on, I'll show you guys the message relayer. So to get it started, it's quite easy. Basically just run. Oops. And then what this will do is it'll spin up both networks. So we've got five nodes on each network. It'll spin up some uh, like Prometheus metrics, uh, which we then feed into Grafana. We've got alerting, you know, in case the network goes down. Um, but this is like the important bit for now, which is the header relayers. So if we go over here and log in, Oops. Uh, so we can take a look at the Malau to Rialto header sync and just get a nice little overview of what's happening. So, um, and then also on the side, we've got the, this is the Rialto network that's running. So we're transferring headers from here to uh, the Malau chain. Um, anything noteworthy here? Let's just give this a sec to load up and then uh, let me just make sure I'm on the right network here as well. Yeah, so this is the, the Malau chain, which is like, you know, the, the buddy chain that we're going to be, um, that we're transferring headers from. So you can see that on the Malau chain, we've, you know, it produced block 11 and on the Rialto chain, it knows about header 10. So it's always gonna be lagging a little bit behind because uh, it takes time to transfer the headers. Uh, so now if we go back here and just comment out or like comment out just this part, I'm gonna show you guys um, what it's like to transfer uh, messages across the bridge. So it's super easy again, we can just run this Oops. Uh, oh, here. So we can go back and we have dashboards for the message sync as well. So we want to Rialto message. This is going to take uh, a sec to load up. Um, but what it's going to be doing is essentially piggybacking off the entire like header sync 
um, like pipeline to be able to transfer messages across. So you'll see that we have no, no messages going through the bridge now. And that's because I've commented out those components, but it knows about like the different finalized headers. Um, it will only send messages if it has, um, if they're included in the finalized header, which is important. And then what we can do is actually go ahead and send a message. So first I'm gonna send a remark, which is just like a comment. I'm gonna send this message from the Malau chain to the Rialto chain. So boop, sent. Um, and then we'll give this a second to load up. So in a couple seconds, we should see like this tick up to one and then an event be dispatched here saying that, oh, we got the message and it was delivered successfully and dispatched successfully. So just give it a sec. It's, it's the same process that's relaying headers and messages, right? Or is it two completely independent things? So they're completely independent, although they share a lot of similarities. Uh, here, I'll finish answering your question in a second. Um, but you can see that on the Rialto chain, we managed to dispatch a message with message ID one that came from the Malau chain. And on the Rialto dashboard, uh, you can see that we delivered like one message um, as far as like the process, yeah, they're like similar in that it's asking like, hey, what messages like do you have? Oh, I have these messages to submit and there's that whole back and forth. Um, but they're like abstracted away. So it's like we have a, a library for syncing messages, a library for syncing headers, and we pull them all together into like a single substrate relay or binary. Okay, so we sent a remark. Now I'm going to go ahead and send a transfer. So what this will do, and this is what's actually on that like diagram that I showed you guys, the one with the blue and purple. So an account on the Rialto chain is going to be sending a transfer, which will, or on the Malau chain, sorry, that will happen on the Rialto chain. So if we go ahead, you can see that this account has no funds um, on the Rialto chain. And if we go back and just wait for this to be enacted or to be dispatched, you'll see that we can actually like, like that new account will have funds. So once again, we'll just give it a sec. Cause it, it's gotta wait for that block to be finalized and like sent across the network. So it's a little slow. Okay, so it knows about a message. This is good. Uh, nice. So you can see that a message was dispatched. Uh, it's a second message. And what happened was that we actually managed to transfer from Dave to Eve. And if we go back here, we can see that Eve now has, um, now has Rialto tokens on a transfer, which was initiated on the Malau chain, which I think is pretty cool um, because it's the exact same thing. Like each chain has the same palettes and, uh, but I'm not going to show you the other way um, right now. Um, are there any questions? Do you guys want to go through the diagram or the flow chart? Actually, I guess we probably should go through the flow chart, but any questions first? No? Okay, so let's just quickly walk through like what happened in that demo. So when I manually sent a message, I was sending that message to the Malau chain. And what like the um what we encoded in that message was a, a transfer for Rialto. So the Malau chain when it got this payload, it had no clue what it was. It was just some like opaque set of bytes. Um and it didn't yeah. really care. Fernando, can you yeah. can you step one 
can you do one step back and then tell us about this uh, and Dave endowment step on the Rialto chain? Oh, sure. Yeah. So we need some way to like actually transfer the funds or even pay for fees on the target chain. So at the beginning, we like, at least in our demo, we had to like hard code some of these addresses into Genesis. Um, so we have Rialto's account or Dave's account on Rialto. We had to like give it some funds. Um, but you could also like um, get funds another way. So like, let's say, um, let's say that Charlie sent Dave some funds on Rialto or to like, Dave's Rialto equivalent account. Um, and now Dave, who's on the Malau chain, wants to spend these funds without going to, you know, the trouble of actually sending a transaction on the Rialto chain. Um, now he can, like, he controls this, like, foreign address from this different chain. So it doesn't really matter how he got, he got the funds, but he needs some sort of, like, funds to pay for fees and obviously if you're doing a transfer to pay for the cost of the transfer. Does that make sense? Why do we need the fun the funds on the target chain? That's that's what I didn't get. Because Dave is sending something from Milau to Rialto, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. he needs he needs to pay the fees on Milau or or so or he pays on, the fees on Rialto. Yeah. Both. So on the Malau chain, he'll pay for like submitting that send message transaction, but on the Rialto chain, he'll also have to pay for the, the transfer dispatch. And also like the, the actual fund from the transfer. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Got it. I wanted to clarify that because we, we have an open issue to actually pay for the pay the dispatch fees on the target chain. Currently, the dispatch fees are also paid on the source chain. But the thing is that what we actually dispatch on the target chain, so on Rialto here, is a transfer of Rialto tokens from Dave controlled account on Rialto. So the thing is that um, in, in some bridges kind of schemes that you might have seen in the past, or if you think about bridging in Ethereum 2.0, you, you usually think about wrapped assets. So you have an ERC20 smart contract that represents Bitcoins on Ethereum, right? Here we don't really bridge, uh, so we don't transfer the assets over the bridge, it's rather Rialto tokens are on Rialto, so there is a balances pilot uh, there, and then Milau is only able to transfer the intent to, uh, sorry, it, it's able to you know send over the bridge the intent to transfer Rialto tokens, but the dispatch actually happens on Rialto, and this is a, this is the part that I skipped earlier on because it means that every time we send a message over the bridge we actually need to specify the origin that is going to be used on the target chain when that message is dispatched. And then maybe I will hand over to Hernando who can say more. Yeah, it's a, I think that's the key point is that we're not like sending wrap tokens or anything like that. Like you're interacting with the native token of that chain, which is a bit of a different shift um, in terms of how we think about you know, bridging and like spending foreign assets on, on these chains. Um, I'm not going to get into the different origins just yet, but in this case, like it actually, I'll, I'll do a little bit about it. This account can have a private key and that's like one type of origin we can use on the target chain, or it may not have a private key. Um, in which case we, we'd also need to fund it and for it to pay for fees and stuff. But it's like, you can use it for different models, but I'm not gonna get into that uh, just now. Um, uh, so the, there, there is a question in, um, in chat. Do Dave have always, 
does Dave have to own addresses on both chains? Okay, so we're like trying to avoid this, but yeah. So no, uh, Dave does not need to own an address on both chains. So uh, where's the other document? So we have a few different origins that we can use on the target chain. So in the demo, we use the target origin. And what the target origin means is that um, the person or the thing sending messages on the source chain also has a private key for the target chain. However, this may not always be the case. So you can use a second origin, which is the source origin, where it'll generate like an account ID randomly for you on the on the target chain and it'll make all the calls from that account id um, there's like no guarantee that that account id has a private key and there like it doesn't need to have one um, and then we have this root origin which is like we're still on the fence about but the idea is that it can represent the source chains you know root account on the target chain if you want it to do some sort of administrative stuff you have some way to prove that that it's actually the root account. So if we go back to our diagram, um, this account is just, it's in like Dave's equivalent account in Rialto, but it, it may not have a private key. Does that answer your question? Okay, so back to what we saw in the demo. So uh, this whole thing is really split into two different like sync pipelines. So first we have the header sync. Um, and basically what what we're doing here, like the interaction is mostly controlled by the, the bridge relayer. Um, and the bridge relayer is trying to look for the best blocks it can sync. So it'll ask the Malau chain, hey, what's the best header you know of? The Malau chain will reply. It'll ask the Rialto chain, hey, what's the best Malau header you know of? Um, it'll reply. And if there's a difference, it'll submit like any newer headers um, that it knows about. Um, at the same time, it's asking about finalized headers. Because um, really anything above the header sync can only act on finalized headers. So that's what's happening here. It's asking, hey, you know, what's the best finalized header? Um, it'll be subscribed to the Malau chain, uh, like over RPC, getting like all these finality proofs. Um, and once again, when it sees that it's got like a better finality proof, um, it'll submit that to the Rialto chain. And then at this point, we can actually go ahead and start delivering messages. So it'll check the Rialto or the Malau chain storage to see if there's any messages for it to submit. Um, if there are, it'll go ahead and send them to the Rialto chain. On the Rialto chain, it'll do a little bit of verification to see if um, if fees are covered, if the right uh, origin is like being used for a particular type of message. It'll see if it can like decode the message, that sort of stuff. And if it can do that, then it'll go ahead and dispatch the message. Um, in our case, that was a transfer of five tokens to um, Eve's account. Um, and at the same time, it'll emit an event, which is what we saw in the Polkadot.js apps interface. Um, with that event, it can go ahead and say, um, like, back to the Malau chain, hey, look, I submitted your message. Can I get paid? The Malau chain will say yes and give it some cash. Um, and now with that, the Rialto chain can go ahead and clean up any, un any old state. Um, so just for like a simple like token transfer, there's like a lot of different steps and back and forth between the different actors in the in the system. Are there any questions with regard to that? Do do we do we actually post the messages on chain or only the ashes or something like that? Uh, no, the like. The messages in storage. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I guess with that, um, 
Do we want to dig through some? Oh no, uh, Keon. Where's the reward coming from? So I'll answer the second question first. So the header relayer is not rewarded because we assume that everything else, well, so everything on top. Um, so since everything else on top of the header sync needs the header sync, people will be incentivized to run the header sync regardless. So they need to run the header sync to do anything with the bridge. Um, so it's kind of like an altruistic sort of thing. Like if you want to get anything done, you need to run the header sync. Um, and where's the reward for the relayer message? So I believe that would come from the fees that like Dave pays. So Dave would pay for that message to get sent. There is a bunch of things that happen when you try to queue the message and um, we can go to maybe testing scenarios document which the same scenario is described but even with more details um, yeah. and there is a, a description like how so whenever you try to send a message we actually reserve a fee and that fee um covers for the deliveries for the costs that the relayer has to deliver this message on the target chain so it actually contains uh weight of the delivery transaction uh together with uh user declared weight of the dispatch cost then we convert the weight into uh, the amount of source, to uh, sorry, the amount of target tokens that you have to pay in fees to kind of dispatch this amount of weight on the target chain. And this is uh, one additional um, assumption or requirement for the entire bridge. Um, or yeah, maybe maybe let me go to this assumption later on. Uh, so, so um, the user that sends the message actually covers all the costs that the relayer has to deliver that message, to dispatch that message, and to confirm that message back to the uh, to the source chain. And on top of that, it uh, the pallet has a parameter that allows you to configure like an extra fee that it pays that the user has to pay on top of this required costs that the relayer has. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, so the the synced header is used more as like um like a reference or checkpoint. So yeah, so if we go back to the diagram, they are separate processes, but when it asks like, hey, do you have any messages to deliver? It's really poking at that chain state at a given point in time and saying like, hey, is there anything in that outbound queue for me to deliver? And it'll check like that, like that point in time needs to be like a finalized block. So, you know, like these messages actually do exist in storage. Yeah, well, in this in this call, we actually say at five in, uh, in, in brackets there because five is the latest finalized block that Milau knows of. So we only can deliver messages that are at block five. Even if the source chain is at block seven already, it doesn't matter because Milau, or sorry, uh, Rialto, or the or Milau's light client uh, within run to, uh, Rialto's runtime only knows about block five being final currently. Yeah, exactly. So it, can you go yeah. back to this diagram? Uh, actually, the, the message that the re, or the call that the relayer is doing to the target chain is called receive messages proof. So we submit a storage proof 
of the source chain and then from this storage proof we extract these messages and the storage proof is verified against uh, so we we take the last finalized header we check the storage root and the proof has to match the storage roof from the from the last finalized header and that's how we actually have the messages it's it's not like the relayer is trusted to like read the messages from the source chain and then deliver them to the target chain untampered it actually generates a storage proof of the outbound lane on the source chain and then de delivers that the storage proof to the target chain and the target chain because it knows of the finalized headers it's able to verify this proof and then extract messages from there um okay thank you i, I think i got that um but do we even need to send the message itself then or are we only saying okay here i have a new message for you at block five just look that up in my storage so the header sync it will only have the headers right so just yeah. by having the header the header contains storage root which is a root hash of this huge merkle tree that has the entire sta state uh, in it and the thing is that uh, yeah, we, we don't want to transfer the entire state of the source chain to the target chain, but rather we want it to know about headers and then we want to present a proof of a particular storage entry that is like of interest to us. So we say, hey, look, there is this outbound lane thing and here is a storage proof that this outbound lane had a particular state at that particular block and it actually contains a list of messages so you can extract it from there okay so so when you're sending the message you are actually sending the storage witness so you can can verify the state. yes so you, you can actually think about the bridge being just the header sync because if you have the header sync you are able to prove anything and you can build applications on top of that so this message delivery is actually like one application that we have built on top of the bridge and it looks at particular storage entries on the source chain and then does something uh, with the storage entries but you can come up with you know you could base it on on uh, maybe yeah maybe frame system events are not a good idea because they are part of the storage as well but you could make something on top of like you know header digests so we you have a header sync, but then the application is actually looking at particular digest items of the header and then creating, like making some actions. It's just our choice that we chose to, you know, build like a little bit more logic and then use storage proofs for, for this. Okay, thanks. And ideally, something that we want to do is like either remove um, so, for instance, the, the content of the messages could safely be stored off-chain and, and we could only store like hashes of the messages on the source chain. And then with the storage proof, we actually give the storage proof of the hashes, but we also deliver the messages uh, themselves. And this is fairly simple optimization that we can, uh, we can do later on. Okay, so let me. Oh, you want to uh, you want to continue, Hernando? Uh, no, I, I think if there are no more questions on the flow diagram, I think what we should do is either like answer more specific questions or like maybe dig through the code if anybody wants to like do that. Um, yeah, I guess. What do you guys want to do? Yeah, to answer Kian's question, can the source make any assumptions about when it's delivered? No. No, they can put an upper bound on it with like extrinsic mortality. <laughs> I guess it, it would work, right? 
Um, yeah, but extrinsic. So, so the thing that we sent in the message payload is actually just encoded call. It's not okay. entire extrinsic. So we don't have like a mortality uh, thing there. But yeah, um, it's actually pretty interesting to introduce something like this. So you say, I want this message to be dispatched, but only if the target chain block is not greater than X. Let's say, right? That's a feature that we could implement. Here in the dispatch layer of the bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna write it down. Um, so there is, uh, yeah, um, so there is a, like one more thing that I wanted to mention earlier. Uh, let me maybe share my screen again. Um, mortality of calls. Here, yeah. So uh, we said that when you have messages in lane, they actually have to be delivered in order, right? And the user is supposed to, we reserve from the user enough fee enough currency like source token currency to cover all the costs that the relayer has on the target chain because obviously uh, like re relayer strategy is to like you know maximize their profit or just make any profit at all so how can we be sure that the fees that we reserve on the source chain are the are are enough to cover relayers costs because if we let users send messages that are below this like profitability point for the relayers, then you know like economically reasonable action for them is to stop delivering these messages, right? And since they have to be delivered in order, this one message can actually kind of block the entire lane from making um, from making any progress uh, at all. So uh, we have a lower bound for this. Obviously like this relayers fee, this is con constant, but we have a, a lower bound for how much tokens you have to pay. And this lower bound is actually based on the Oracle that tell us what is the exchange rate between source tokens and, and target tokens. And that's obviously far from perfect as well because that requires an external component that will tell us the price um, it's only the lower bound so we don't strictly require that like users are fine to overpay if the price oracle is lagging behind um, if uh, yeah so if if the the the, the so either users will heavily overpay because they have to pay above the minimum and the minimum might be um, like old enough or they will uh, it will be possible for them to underpay a little bit but we hope that the fact that you can put more messages to the lane and the default strategy for the relayer will be to kind of look at, at the entire lane because this is it's it's not like in Ethereum where some of these message messages might not be able to cover the costs for you. If you look at the entire lane, this is like your your profit that you're gonna make, right? This, because these funds are already reserved. Um, so if we see that there is a message that is you know like below this profitability point, other users can put more messages that will kind of top up the the total reward for the pain uh, for the lane to actually pay pay the free layer there is an open issue as well to actually be able to top up specific message so you can say okay i want this message to be delivered because it's like clogging up the pay uh, the the lane so you can kind of like subsidize the the lane if the price oracle is not doing um its job properly so but this is yeah. can we do that on the target side Yes, so the, the, there is this additional issue that we have open as well, because currently we pay all the fees on the source, chain, uh, source site, and we want to decouple the dispatch fees from, um, from, the, uh, from this. So you would pay uh, the cost of delivery 
on the source chain, but the actual dispatch would be paid on the on the target chain. And and obviously, like dispatch costs should be the majority of the of the fees that you are uh, you are paying, right? Um, so that will kind of make the reliance on the oracle much slower, uh, much uh, smaller. Sorry. Um, I I like I haven't thought that much if it's possible to completely pay all the fees on the target chain, but it definitely it would definitely make the relayer strategy like much more complicated because they have to look um, at the target chain first if they if 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 a message will pay them if they deliver that. So they would probably need some kind of mechanism where they can choose messages to deliver or, or rather um, prove that a message is not able, like won't be delivered because the target, uh, on the target they are not getting paid for that message. What else? We can go more into details of the call origin that you've mentioned. Um, let me jump to the code. So, uh, as Hernando mentioned earlier, we support three different uh, call origins. Um, this one, let's let's leave it out because we are still unsure if, if this is something that we want to include at all. But the main, um, like one of the one of the main two uh, cases is source account. So the way it works is when you send the message, you say, "I want the call to be dispatched from an account ID that is derived." from my source account ID. So I'm Dave on the source chain and there is a like a representation of my account ID on their target chain. Uh, I think that the basic implementation is just to like concatenate something to your account ID and then um, hash it and then that's the, the target account ID that you that you get. Um, so every user of the source chain can easily generate the account that they also own or, or the account ID that they can control on the target chain. So this endowment step that we had in, um, in this flow chart here, this is we take um, Dave's account, we kind of derive a Rialto account out of it, and then we can transfer some funds to, to Dave. And like we hope that this will be completely transparent in the, in the UI where if you put um, an account ID of Milao chain, because we have the, the chain um, kind of encoded in the addresses as well, then we will know that if you want to transfer Rialto tokens, then they should actually go to this Dave derived uh, account on, on, on the Rialto chain. Um, and that's one case. Uh, and the second case is is what Hernando mentioned as well is if you control target uh, if you can control an account ID if you have a private key for the target chain you can actually submit a public key and a signature of that account and we will dispatch this from from an account ID uh, that you actually own on the target chain as well uh, the thing is that the source chain um, so, so there is a bunch of things that we verify on the source chain before we send the message, and there is a bunch of things that we verify on the target chain before we dispatch the message. So for instance, this signature here, this is something that we check on the target chain because we don't want to assume that the, the source chain is even able to understand that crypto uh, that is used here, and, and we don't really put any um, requirements on that crypto. So on the source chain, we only verify that the source chain account ID is something that um, that you control. So we check ensure signed when you send the message, and we compare it to this source chain account ID. 
and on the target chain we actually verify this signature and the signature is um, yeah, let me find it in the code the way we create the signature is we here is we take the message so the call that we will actually dispatch on the target chain we append the source account ID to it and that's what you should sign before you send the message so we know that it's the call and it has it has to be sent by the source account ID so you kind of um, kind of grant the source account ID access to or, or the right to dispatch this call on your behalf and um, yeah, on the previous audit that we had internally last week, we have identified that this is kind of susceptible to replace. So if you if you want to use this particular call origin for um, in case you don't control the source account as well, so you ask someone, hey, can you sign this for me? And then you send, send the signed message over the bridge. Like I can ask Hernando, hey, can you sign for me a transfer of like five Rialto tokens to my account, right? And like, don't bother dispatching it, this transfer. I will actually go to my chain and I will dispatch this for you. You just need to provide me with this signature over the call and over, over my account ID because I'm gonna be dispatching it. And then uh, since it doesn't include anything unique to this particular transaction, I can actually send multiple messages like that so I can drain Hernando's account by by issuing multiple calls like this so our um, initial assumption with this was uh, that the target account and the source account have to be controlled by the same person because the re like the replay protection is is controlled on the source chain but uh, later on I actually forgot about this assumption and then come up with some ideas how it could be used kind of beyond uh, having source and, and a target account being controlled by the same person. And then it turned out to be susceptible to, to this um, replay attacks. Any other questions? So, so, so what what happened in the end with that that last thing? Uh, what will be the design that actually gets deployed? It wasn't clear to me. Um, Specifically, with the the source and the target being different accounts. Okay, so so it it can be different accounts. It actually like most likely will be different accounts. But the thing is, who controls the private keys? So. We have a plan to document this properly, that you should not sign things that people ask you to sign, <laughs> which is kind of obvious. Uh, like, obviously, it's, it's not transactions on your kind of home chain, right? So if I'm a Polkadot user, I, I should never like receive a transaction from someone and then sign it because that's something that can be dispatched on the chain directly. And here there is a, this additional condition. Okay, if you receive something like this, which is a call and a, an a account ID, then you should never really sign it for someone else if they request you to. Um, and that's like sort of a documentation issue. Um, yeah, and like unless we, ha we can come up with some um, some idea of, of making this replay uh, resilient. So the, the plan was actually to deploy both target account and source account, but with this additional note, like security note, hey, same like with the transactions, if someone asks you to sign something, just don't do it because it's potentially something that can be dispatched over the bridge. Yeah, you should do that. I mean, there needs to be a bit of UE support. That's already a problem for multi-signatures where it's dreadful. You can't tell what it is you're signing, um, but so I was more interested in the, in the case where the source doesn't actually have a private key mm -hmm. because it's a DAO. All right, so specifically, currently on, on on the relay chain, that would mean the treasury, but eventually we'll have smart contracts and things. Yeah, um, yeah. So so then um, so we were assuming that 
the source account, this is an account ID, not a public key, right? So it represents something that the source chain, um, uh, like source chain can put whatever it wants here, here. By default, if it's the user, like an external user sending an external transaction uh, to the pallet, this will be, uh, we actually do verify it here. So if you try to send call origin source account, then we verify that the sender origin is actually matching this source account ID that you expect to send on the target chain. If you are a root account, so for instance, if you are you know, a treasury pallet or, or if you're a democracy proposal, you can put whatever account ID you want here. So we assume it's gonna be uh, you know, like a hash of, of, of treasury string or something like that. And that will be the representation. Like this will later on, on the target chain, end up being an account ID uh, of the target chain. So we can represent treasury uh, like that as well. So can I can I send to, uh, something to the treasury on uh, on on on, on polka dot from Kusama? Uh, you so you want to? I don't know why, but maybe I want to send to the treasury on on. on... Okay. Yeah. So then you. Uh, so so this doesn't have a key. Yeah. So the the account ID is is uh, is going to be constant. Like if we figure out like what's the scheme. So if, if there is like, let's say it's like a hash of, uh, of treasury string and that's the source account ID and then the target account ID will be a hash of the treasury string concatenated with the source chain name and then hashed again. Uh, so yeah, you just pick this as a, as a recipient of dots and you can either send a message over the bridge or you can send directly from the polka dot chain and you send a transfer to this account ID and this account ID is like forever associated with with the treasury if that does make sense okay it's basically like every source account ID has some representation on the target chain and the source account ID is like the entire space of of account IDs we don't even we, we don't know if they have a public key or a sorry, private key or not it's just the entire space that we derive into some other uh, space or map into into this other space. Yeah, and as long as you know like the derivation scheme, you can treat it like any other account ID on the target chain. Yeah, we, we initially were thinking as well about doing this wrap tokens things because um, there are obviously like different trade-offs uh, that you get if you do this. So if we we could, uh, so what we could do is we could on the source chain deploy another balances palette, and then this balances palette would represent wrap tokens of the target chain. So let's say wrap dots, and uh, then on the source chain you are able to query dot balance of someone, and, and this is something that is not possible if we just transfer the intent. Um, but then the problem is if you kind of teleport these assets from one chain to another, do you actually burn them or do you just lock them in this like very special account ID controlled by the bridge palette? Um, and there is like a lot of kind of state uh, waste. Not, not like we not generate much state waste already <laughs> in our design, but uh, there is this additional state that we would have to clean up. And um, for Polka.Kusama Bridge, the idea was that if we don't have para chains, uh, we still want to deploy the bridge on the relay chains directly. Uh, and later on, when we get para chains, then we will migrate this bridge from uh, bridging relay chains to actually bridging para chains and since we don't do this wrap tokens we we can like this transition would be like much easier right because there's nothing that changes we only need to maintain the same derivation scheme as Fernando mentioned for the for the account IDs so we could we could then transition we could kill the bridge on the relay chain and, and spawn another bridge on the on the para chains 
we, we have we have to clean up the palettes obviously but that should be easy because there is a common prefix for all storage entries and uh, like we don't went, we don't have to mess up with balances because balances are just internally managed by by polka.chain balances module and when we didn't really change anything here and obviously the first instance of the bridge the first deployment uh, will have um, will be doing a lot of filtering on the calls that you can actually make uh, so I guess initially we will just have a one like one lane uh, that is whitelisted so that you can't spam like all this random lanes and uh, this lane will be dedicated to to token transfers so it will only accept calls that are actually token transfers calls on the on the target chain so once you have this on a, on a power chain and power chains exist then it's almost certainly going to be the case that every single project that has a power chain on on polka and kusama is going to want to use this for wrap tokens or to send messages between their power chains or to do something involving wrap tokens so do you have plans for that to support wrap tokens you mean yeah support wrap tokens or arbitrary messages between power chains that, that clearly you probably need both uh yeah i mean so there's like multiple things uh involved here but eventually like the, the the super end goal is actually to migrate the message payload format from this encoded call to xcm so i imagine that whatever will be used for xcmp like you know inter parachain communication within the relay chain like we will be able to use the same format for uh, for you know, in inter so intra chain and then inter chain uh, communication. So I will be Kusama Parachain will be able to send an XCM payload that will be received by Polkadot Parachain and hopefully understood by uh, by this Parachain as well. Maybe we need to like prepend it with something, but I expect the format to be um, to be common for XCMP. HRMP and, and bridge messages as well. And um, regarding like how a parachain on Kusama can send messages to, um, to a parachain on Polkadot, this requires a bunch of um, hops, right? Because you start from a parachain, then you send uh, XCMP to the bridge parachain. That has to be unpacked and then this actually queues a message to be delivered over the bridge. The, the message gets delivered to the bridge parachain, then it's dispatched on the bridge parachain uh, on the Polkadot site, and then this dispatch is actually sending another XCMP to another parachain. Is, is that, that does answer your question? That, that, that's messages, but are we going to be, are we going to support wrapping of tokens other than KSM and DOT? Yes, so XC, XCM format supports like this teleporting tokens, teleporting assets. And the thing is that if there is an uh, a XCM executor, which is a palette that is able to interpret uh, XCM messages, it actually knows how to deal with these messages. So it means that, at least that's my assumption, that when you, tele when you send a message which teleports an asset, it actually knows how to, like that there is this like frame assets instance uh, that is a wrapped token of that asset and the teleported asset is is then minted on within this palette. Right, but the bridge itself won't be minting wrapped tokens for, for random stuff. Uh, no, so, I so don't. It, it, you know, otherwise, you'd have, to, you'd have to talk to a specific parachain to, to, to do it. Yeah, I think so, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how XCM executor is going to work and handle these cases but I mean I, I'm kind of piggybacking on this is a problem that parachains has as well so it's gonna if it's solved then we're gonna just adopt their their solution but we are not working specifically on something I mean we could just deploy another instance of balances palette and then we could like this is actually something that we have planned to do uh, earlier where we create a palette that is um, sending a specific kind of messages over the 
the bridge and these messages are like mint tokens on the other side in the secondary instance of balances palette and that would require the source root uh, account verification so we say okay a root of the source chain actually requested uh, minting of wrapped uh, source chain tokens and um, yeah we, we kind of authorize through this source root thing that makes sense yeah work on, on token standards will probably be ongoing for a long time to go so, yeah. yeah. Should we talk a little bit about like uh, our future plans? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there's not that much there. Um, there is obviously a full list of, of known issues, and um, so known issues are like are these things that I've listed uh, below here, and this is something that we have to implement before we deploy the first version of Birch. There is a bunch of improvements that we also have in the issue tracker um, listed and the, the main things I've already mentioned like you know making like not relying on on-chain storage that much, making the bridge more storage efficient on the both sides. Uh, then potentially switching to beefy as well because if we want to maybe, maybe not for polka.kusama but if you want to deploy this bridge to to bridge to other substrate based chains then syncing the entire header history might not be necessary and beefy would be much better choice where you can beefy plus mmr where you just bridge uh, when you just uh, sync one commitment per per session or per epoch and you are able to prove this rarely uh, transferred messages efficiently. Um, as I mentioned, this, the audit, the external audit is planned for the first weeks of January. And even though we are not fully ready because we have this known issues, as I mentioned, the audit company is totally fine with that. So they are uh, working in a similar fashion with, with the parachain teams, with the parachain team. So they, if they know that something will be changed, they can uh, include that into into their audit as well. And then they can review the PRs uh, that bring this this fix that we know of. Um, so there is a lot of UI work that that uh, we would also like to do. For instance, this token transfer thing that Hernando showed you, right now he, he used like a, a magical bash script that actually calls a bunch of CLIs and generates this transaction and dispatches that on chain. Uh, ideally, I would like to, for the first use case, ideally I would like to see a UI where you see your accounts on the chain that you are connected to and then the the derived accounts on the target chain and you can see your balance of the uh, of the target chain tokens and you're able to send a transfer either to an account that is derived from the source chain account or or to to an existing tar target chain account um, this kind of like super grant plan for ui work is to have polka.js apps uh, be able to like dynamically load bridge specific tabs uh, in case it's connected to a to a chain that has bridge de uh, deployed on it and you can have multiple instances of bridge so you connect to let's say this polkadot chain or a para chain uh, that is connected to polkadot and it actually has three bridges and you get three additional tabs in polkadot.js UI that allow you to interact with this with these uh, these bridge chains. Um, yeah, uh, currently we are focused on like bridging these relay chains, but the the next thing that we have to work on is bridging with para chains. Luckily, like this mostly involves this like first layer this this sorry this layer here the header sync layer the delivery will most likely be almost the same but with parachains we actually import headers from a parachain but finality proofs come from from relay chain right so yeah we actually need to have kind of two uh, two header chains uh, in that palette 
um, and the proofs are a little bit different as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Is there anything else apart from this? Um, yeah, okay, so as a bridge team, like maybe beyond the substrate to substrate bridge, uh, we also plan to make um, all of the components that we have uh, kind of configurable uh, and, and easily reusable for other bridges so that people can create their own bridges um, if they want by using our components. So for instance, reusing relayers or reusing the, the palettes and just plugging different verification scheme. And uh, that's the, the kind of librification process that we, we plan to do. And also like we might consider bridging other chains because if we have this uh, things Kind of generalized, and we only need to plug uh, like bunch a bunch of configuration parameters plus verification. Uh, you know all these things that are specific to a to a particular uh, chain. Then why not bri bridge? You know like uh, other chains that allow us to deploy the same or similar scheme. Um, obviously, for some like Ethereum or Bitcoin, you require a completely different. Uh, mechanisms because, for instance, on Bitcoin you don't really, you can't really build a, a full light client of Grandpa, and on Ethereum you can't as well. But for different reasons, it's just like too expensive to build one. Um, so we need some more uh, sophisticated schemes. But but what we're working on with Beefy will will maybe allow that. So I mean, I have some fun ideas for even how to bridge with Ethereum too, which will be tricky, uh, but possible. <laughs> Yeah, but but uh, but again, you like if you bridge a chain that has like different properties, you have to kind of start from scratch because you start from this header sync, and that's usually the most difficult part. But then you can't easily reuse this like message delivery and message dispatch thing, right? Unless they are like super generic protocols. Uh, but you obviously, you the header sync is. You have, have to be very generic. So the header sync and the justifications would look completely different. But maybe you want to be a bit generic over that in any case, because like having Beefy and Grandpa um, in the same code would be nice. Yeah. Um, and then so the obviously the state proofs would have to be substrate specific, unless you get really generic. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, I guess um, guys sleep over this and like feel free to join Bridges channel and ask any more questions you want. Um, if, if someone would like to break our test network, we are, we are happy to see that. Uh, for instance, you can try submitting multiple headers and see how we don't handle that particular case uh, or do like any other weird things that, that might be worth doing. And yeah, if you if you have any additional questions later on, just feel free to reach to us. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Yeah, thank you for the time, and have a good evening.